Good afternoon to everyone who's joined us for our latest MedStrom webinar. I'm Debbie, I'm MedStrom's clinical director, and I'm accompanied by Helen, who is our sales director. Welcome to everyone who's joined us today uh, for this latest CPD accredited webinar. We're really grateful for your time. We have two speakers for today's webinar. We will begin with Julie Tyra. Julie Tyra is Tissue Viability Nurse Consultant at Liverpool Heart and Chest NHS Foundation Trust. Julie has specialised in tissue viability for the last 20 years in both the community and acute settings. Julie holds a BA Honours in Healthcare with a Specialist Practitioner Qualification in Tissue Viability and an MSc in Professional Clinical Practice. Julie works as a nurse consultant offering clinical support with the management of patients with complex wounds. She leads on the trust strategy relating to wounds and pressure ulcers. Julie has worked with the National Wound Care Strategy Programme, spoken at conferences, delivered webinars and published in the nursing press on topics including surgical site infection, pressure ulcers and moisture associated skin damage. Our speakers are combining their presentation today so they can share their experience and expertise with us. Angie Cumber is the Clinical Coding Manager at the Liverpool Heart and Chest Hospital Foundation Trust. She has over 30 years clinical coding experience at both large and specialist trusts. Angie has experience of all coding specialities and has built up excellent clinical engagement over the years. Since 2016, Angie has worked closely with tissue viability nurses at Liverpool Heart and Chest Hospital NHS Foundation Trust. Due to participation in the National Wound Care Strategy Programme's Pressure Ulcer Pilot, Angie has been able to share her experience and clinical coding knowledge with tissue viability nurses and clinical coding colleagues across the country. So let's start with the presentation and welcome Julie Tyra uh, and Angela, Angie Cumber to present on the model healthcare system. Thanks, Helen. Um, my name's uh, Julie Tyra and I work in Liverpool Heart and Chest. Um, thanks to Menstrom for inviting me to talk about this topic. Uh, it's a topic that's new to uh, everybody. Uh, I'm going to give a brief introduction to um, the background, really, to, to how pressure ulcers have been reported nationally in the past and depends on how old you are uh, you might remember some or all of them i remember most of them uh, as helen said uh, i feel like i've been a tissue viability nurse uh, all my life so hopefully we can uh, go down memory lane when we look at those different ways that the pressure ulcers have been nationally reported in the past uh, and you will then talk about um coding and data which is really crux to this uh, this new pressure ulcer surveillance, uh, the use of the model hospital system. And then I'll uh, finish with a, a brief kind of look around uh, the, the system uh, and, and some kind of additional kind of tips that, that really Angie and I have, have learned as we've gone along. So we've been one of the pilot sites um, working with the National Wound Care Strategy. We were funded by NHS England and Improvement. Um, so jot down any questions as we go. I can already preempt uh, a couple of questions that will be around data and coding that I'll pass to Angie, uh, but let's make a start. So what we'll, we'll cover, as I said, is how pressure data has been collected in the past, the difference between local reporting and national reporting, who uses it for why, why a new system was deemed to be needed, uh, and you will talk about coding uh, and data and then introduction to the model system and really for uh, for you guys on the call you've joined because this affects you in some way or you, you've got a, a, an interest in it so really kind of what does it mean for us uh, what do we need to know what do we we need to be prepared for really so start a trip down memory lane now um I don't remember what happened in the 70s because I was born in the 70s. Uh, but during the early 70s, organisations started to be interested in trying to quantify the problem. So trying to be aware of, of how, how big is the problem of pressure ulcers. There'd been an interest in it for, for many years. But the 70s saw those initial audits that were trying to quantify it. However, it was individual studies, either looking at 
specialties such as critical care or paediatrics or it was looking at different uh, countries and some publications try to to make some comparisons but it's very difficult to compare one set of data with another set of data that's happening in one specialism or or one country or another because these audits and these kind of crude measures of pressure ulcers all use different methods different definitions and therein lies a very big problem when you try and compare uh, data in from one area to another is that unless it's collected and collated in the same way it's very hard to compare uh, like with like and make those comparisons then in the 1980s and 90s i remember this uh, pressure also prevalence became quite popular so many organizations did this which was on one set day once every six months once a year some organizations did it more often than that um there would be a count of pressure ulcers this was really arduous and i'm not familiar um uh, or aware of organizations who've who've necessarily continued this to the same degree uh, because it's such hard work uh, if you were doing it properly it was a physical check of every patient in your organization and a check of the documentation uh, to support pressure also prevention and management so it was it was it was very hard work in the early 1990s 1993 pressure ulcers was referred to in a key department of health document as a key quality indicator and from that point forward it's always been associated uh, with a quality uh, improvement strategy or a, a trust's quality agenda uh, so a very much linked with quality um, and unfortunately until recently arguably still um, it's a it's an indicator of, of nursing care and in the early 1990s, more organizations started to, to try and collect accurate data. 1996, the European Pressure Ulcer Advisory Panel was founded, and that was tasked with uh, achieving a reduction in pressure ulcers. And there was a focus also in UPAP's um, terms of reference, that there was a focus on collection of data. In 2010, uh, pressure ulcers were talked about as being avoidable um, and unavoidable but there was a focus uh, on the fact that a high percentage of pressure ulcers uh, were avoidable then we saw quality in innovation productivity and prevention or quips that you might remember uh, again a focus on reducing pressure ulcers so pressure ulcers as a topic was being talked about in lots of quality initiatives, uh, lots of data initiatives. Um, and then we had the foundation in 2010. We had the uh, introduction of the NHS safety thermometer um, and sequence. Now, I'm sure if you've worked in uh, tissue viability or quality, you'll, you'll be familiar with the NHS safety thermometer, which actually only ceased in uh, April 2020 uh, but for 10 years it had its run and for 10 years once a month organ NHS organizations were requested to submit the number of pressure ulcers so it was a it was a, a point prevalence it was on that day on this month how many pressure ulcers have you got so a prevalence compared to the actual number and there's lots of debate and discussion about what's more useful to uh, to an organization locally and nationally is a prevalence to give a, a feel uh, or is it instance which gives you the actual number and at the same time organizations are encouraged to report pressure ulcers as clinical incidences um, so clinical incident systems feed into the national report and, and learning system and in addition to that higher category pressure ulcers uh, moderate or severe harm uh, were encouraged to be reported to the strategic exec information system that we know as stakes so 2010 safety thermometer 2011 stop the pressure and focus this time not on just data and counting but a, a real focus on quality improvement as in what initiatives can, can we introduce to try and um, reduce this number in 2016 that became national so the national stop the pressure program 
um, that was led by NHS uh, England and now NHS England Improvement. And their focus, still on quality, but it was it was about consistent measurement and report. And so the organisations were all providing the same um, the same measures of, of, of data for consistency and standardisation. There were problems with NHS safety thermometer and um, many tissue viability peers uh, shared the same opinion as me, which kind of what value did it have? Um, capturing the number of pressure ulcers on one day that included organisation acquired and pressure ulcers that were present on, on admission. Uh, to capture them all, it's not really going to be useful for us locally, um, but yeah, it, it could give a feel of the national uh, picture. Some criticisms of it though, that variation um, in reporting that some organisations might have underreported and that some organisations could manipulate the data. Um, at taking an audit on the 20th of, of the month, you could have 50 organisation acquired pressure ulcers that all get discharged on, on the 19th. So that uh, that capture on the 20th isn't going to be reflective, a, a true reflection of your pressure ulcer activity. And as a result of the variations, data then uh, became not comparable between organisations. And at times it was unfairly used um, to benchmark organisations and to compare um, one with another. And then <laughs> relying on data from clinical incident reporting, uh, as a as a as a measure of pressure ulcer activity again it's fraught with problems. Um, first of all, it relies on one hundred percent of uh, pressure ulcers being reported and being reported accurately. Um, and also, where um, this has been unfortunate is where some organisations have been uh, dealt with in, in a punitive way. What I mean by that is is, is when the people who are looking at this data such as um, your own um, senior nurse and exec teams, your own trust boards, but also uh, commissioners. If you're an organisation who reports all of your high category pressure ulcers and you're being compared to organisations who, who, who don't, uh, then you're going to look as though you're a poorly performing organisation. Um, and unfortunately, that has meant punitive um, conversations and, and, and challenges for, for those organisations. And incident reporting and the safety thermometer, um, arguably a, a systems that take a lot of time, uh, a lot of nurses' time, tissue vitals nurses' time and verifying the, the pressure levels and categories. And arguably that takes attention away from quality improvement and prevention. I slightly disagree with that, but we'll pick up on that later. So for all the, the history of, of, of national data collection and the, the issues that have been highlighted now, that led on uh, to the development of the model health system, health system, which is going to be the, the new place where the data is captured and it's a, it's a national pressure ulcer surveillance system. I'm going to hand over to Angie now to talk about the cohesion section, but we will pick up on this as in the difference between a national surveillance system for pressure ulcers and how that differs from your local a monitoring system and who is going to look at this national system and what is it going to be used for uh, but we we do need to uh, to to clarify and hear from angie before we, we move on to that system thanks angie thank you julie um, um, so, um, so first we're going to look at um clinical coding data then we're going to look at the flow of of coded data and then I'll offer you some advice and guidance to ensure that your data is correct. Right, so some of you may be aware of clinical coding and have heard of ICD-10, and some of you may not have heard of it, but I'm sure by the end of today, you will be aware of ICD-10. So ICD-10, which is an abbreviation for the International Statistic Classification of Disease and Related Health Problems. So you can see why it's abbreviated because it's quite long-winded title. Um, the number 10 refers to the 10th revision of the classification. The current version was released in April 1995 and updated editions since then, with the latest one published in 2016. Okay, so the ICD classification 
is used in 43 member states across the world. It's convened and published by the World Health Organization. Throughout the NHS, ICD-10 is used to record all diagnostic and inpatient activity. There are dedicated codes for pressure ulcers, which are termed as decubitus ulcer and pressure area within the ICD-10 classification. The role of clinical coders, clinical coders are trained to abstract the required and relevant information from patient's record and assign the correct diagnostic and procedural information into a coded format. All clinical coders are trained to national clinical coding standards with the recommendation to use the full patient's health record as the primary source documentation for clinical coding, whether this be electronic or paper records. Within the national coding standards, there are key notes to remember as what can and cannot be coded. For example, we certainly do code a definite diagnosis as well as probable, presumed or treated as. However, things that we can't code is a differential diagnosis, possible likely suspected or impression or a question mark that's put on before or after a diagnosis or symptom that is recorded in a patient's record. The ICD-10 codes and the description for pressure ulcers start with the code L890 stage one decubitus ulcer. Moving on to stage two, L891 for a stage two decubitus ulcer. And then um, L892 for a stage three, L89.3 for a stage four decubitus ulcer, followed by L89.9 decubitus ulcer and pressure area. Now, what I would say is that the L89.9 should very rarely be used, and therefore it is important that you look at the staging of the pressure ulcer and ensure that that is documented clearly and have a mechanism in place to capture anything that's not stageable at any given time. So to support um, pressure ulcers recording and to provide accurate data, an additional code can be sequenced after the code from L890 to L89.9 to show whether the pressure ulcer was a hospital acquired or not. The ICD-10 code and description for a hospital acquired condition is Y95X, nosochromial condition. So a couple of examples, if you had a stage two pressure ulcer, uh, you would code to L98.1. If you had a stage one pressure ulcer that was acquired during a hospital inpatient stay, this would be coded to L89.0 plus Y95.X. So using those two codes together shows you that the patient had a pressure ulcer and it was acquired during their hospital stay. Present on admission, ICD-10 classification does not provide codes to support data capture for conditions present on admission and therefore does not fit into the remit of clinical coders. However, capturing present on admission is important and this is being reviewed. Therefore, at present, if a patient does not have a Y95X recorded, following a pressure ulcer code, it will default to a present on admission category. So now looking at the flow of coded data. So what you have is that you have the trust coded data, then that is sent on to something that is SUS, which I'll explain about in detail, followed on by HES, and then that data is then submitted to model hospital. And that's where we can see our data um, recorded. So all trusts have their own internal clinical coding deadlines, which links in with the secondary user service, which is known as SUS. Now, SUS is a single comprehensive repository for healthcare in England, which enables a range of reporting to support the NHS in the delivery of healthcare. The submission to SUS data is submitted via the commissioning data set, which is known as the CDS, and it has its own deadlines for data submission, which is known as flex and freeze, which is to support payment by results. An example of a flex and freeze deadline would be as follows. If you took the coded data month 
of March 2022, the inclusion and the submission deadline for March April March 22 would be in April 2022. And therefore, the freeze date for the March 2022 coded data would be in the May 2022. The reason for the flex and freeze dates is to enable any updates to clinical coding or amendments to be made to coding data. And this is an ideal opportunity if you had an unstageable pressure ulcer for your coding to be updated um, to provide more accurate data, which then would ultimately be submitted to, to model hospital. Once the data has been frozen, any changes to the tariff, be that payment or funding, the trust receives, it cannot be altered if a trust has undercharged their commissioners and therefore may have a financial impact. So looking at the further of the data flow, HES, HES is a data warehouse containing all admissions, outpatient appointments and A&E attendances at NHS hospitals in England, used to analyse hospital activity for monitoring and improving the management of health care and services. Model Hospital System NHS England is a data-driven improvement tool that enables NHS health systems and trust to mench mark quality and productivity data for acute, ambulance and commuter NHS, community NHS trusts. So therefore, all the data is submitted then onto um, Model Hospital. Data will not be available for Model Hospital until after the freeze dates, and there may be a time delay of four months or more before you can trust you can review your own trust data on the portal. And this is obviously to allow for data refreshes to ensure that the data is accurate once it reaches Model Hospital. Data flow for community services is different to inpatient care and has its own submission data set and process, which I believe is under review to support pressure ulcer data from a community perspective. So now to offer you some advice and some guidance um, from, to ensure that your data is correct. The top priority I would say to you all today is engage with your clinical coding teams as soon as possible. And certainly, familiarise yourself with the ICD codes for pressure ulcers and understand the different categories in the codes. Clearly documenting your patient records, whether this be electronic or paper, um, for the information so that it can be abstracted by your clinical coding team. Record if a pressure ulcer was hospital acquired or present on admission, because again, this allows to support learning curves and trends going forward. Improve your documentation, electronic or paper records. Certainly, this is something that Julie and I have done since working together. Identify and agree a location for clinical coders to find the information in a patient's record. This will speed up the time um, for clinical coders to find that information. Review data with your clinical coding team and agree how to manage cases that have delayed staging. And this is really important that to support avoiding the code L8.99 and improve your quality of your coded data. And finally, undertake joint clinical coding reviews because this will then identify any problems that you have um, from either from the coding teams or yourselves, which will then provide you with more experience and understanding of the data once it reaches model hospital. And I'll pass you back to Julie now. Thank you. Doesn't code and blow your mind. Uh, I've still not got my head quite round it, um, but uh, it will all fall into place in the next 10 minutes. So model health system or model hospital. So the overarching um, umbrella term is model health system. If you work in an acute session, it's model hospital. There is model community and there's model uh, mental health as well. But model health system is the, the, the overarching um, site. So this came about after Law Carter's recommendations and Law Carter recommended that you had a system that was driven by data um, from which organisations could benchmark against each other. Its selling point, it claims, is that using the model hospital system uses existing data. So there's no extra work in terms of submitting the data like with 
the NHS, NHS safety thermometer where organisations had to collate, uh, not just pressure ulcers, there was four patient harms, uh, had to collate all that data, check it and then submit it. This is using existing data, so no one needs to um, submit any, it's just uh, captured along with the rest of the data that's submitted from coding. Now data for national level, level report of, uh, of pressure ulcers is to give um, NHS England improvement uh, an, a, a, an overview or a feel of how big the problem is, is it getting better, is it getting worse and that type of national level report feeds into national uh, level initiatives um, and strategies. What we're uh, being encouraged to use Model, Hos Model Hospital for is to look at your own organisation's data compared to other trusts, compared to the national average, or, and you can compare it to your peer groups and you can even choose who you compare it to. Overall, the model hospital system is trying to reduce um, unwarranted variation in uh, how NHS organisations um, work uh, in terms of the quality, safety and productivity. It aims to provide a lot of, uh, a lot of analytical insights so you've got the data you can analyze it in different ways and again the fundamental um, basis is that it's to drive improvements and it's also making claims that it will support the restoration recovery uh, and transformation services so who's it important to a lot of the time um it it accuse or community it's fallen to tissue viability nurses uh, in terms of uh, maintaining uh, a, a local uh, record of uh, pressure ulcer data. What tissue viability nurses and maybe quality leads, risk management leads, what we need to make sure our organisations are ready uh, for, um, we need to make sure that they understand the new system, what it's claiming to show, um, we need to make sure that this system accurately represents our pressure ulcer uh, incidents um, because as Angie said this information about pressure ulcers is all taken uh, from the clinical coders and it's fed into a system that feeds into model hospital system so if the clinical coders aren't picking out accurate um, pressure ulcer information um, it's going to reflect when we look at the model hospital uh, data. So really is on us to try and get the documentation uh, as concise as it can be and as easy for the clinical coders to be able to extract. Um, so that's something that uh, you, you potentially need, need to do. The difference between national surveillance and clinical incident reporting is that, uh, as I said, the, the, the idea between national surveillance of pressure ulcers is uh, to capture uh, a feel for it and to drive um, quality improvements. Clinical incident systems are really to, to learn from it, but it's a focus on patient safety, um, not about quality initiatives. So there are a couple of differences there. So the model health system, you may or may not have heard of it and you may or may not have ever logged in. Before you log in, you have to register. Uh, so you type in model hospital or model health system it, it's your first search on on google or you can type in that web address there that takes you to the registration page um, it's anybody who works in the nhs can register and view model health system it does a, a quick verification and asks you to um to, to to verify your email address so they send you you register they send you an email you verify that it is you um, and then you can log in takes you to your main homepage for your organisation. So you must be mindful that you're looking at your organisation. A little bit further on uh, in the system, you can compare to other organisations, but the homepage is it's, it's all about your organisation. The model ambassador, every NHS organisation has a model, uh, a model health ambassador. And these are uh, individuals within your organisation uh, who are already looking at model hospital or model community they're already looking out for other things. What's new is the pressure ulcer data is going to be included on it, but they're already looking out for other things. So they're already very familiar with it. They're experts in it. Um, they will help you use model hospital system or model community. They will help you 
look at it, understand what the data means, and they'll also support you if you do want to network with others. Uh, because at the end of the day, it, it's the idea behind it is that you benchmark against others and it allows you opportunities for improvement. Let's have a look at the system. I've took a series of screenshots that um, will be shared after the, the webinar uh, that you might find useful when you first register and log in uh, as you get used to navigating your way around. But it is a system that really you, you play with, you can change different views um, and that's the best way uh, or certainly link in with your model health ambassador. So you type in model.nhs.uk or model health system, model hospital, brings you to this page. If you've never used it before, click on register, go through that process. Uh, you'll then get a username, you'll create a password, and then you log in. When you log in, it takes you to this screen. So in the, the top bar, it'll have the name of your organisation. So these are screenshots that I took a couple of months ago. So it's got the name of my organisation there. Um, it's got a bit about estates and facilities. This page is called Opportunities for Improvement because that's what it's all about. And we want to then click on the Quality of Care button. When we do that, it takes us to this screen. Our organisation name is still there. This is our organisation's data. Quality of Care is near the top left. And then on that page, it will have your CQC uh, rating and uh, where you fit in in the, the national picture. Um, and then it's got a, a, a circle there for pressure ulcers. So we're going to click on the pressure ulcer uh, tab there and that will take us to the next screen. Now this looks horrific. Uh, I know it does. And the first time you look at this screen, this is a screenshot of part of the screen. Um, there's lots of other data. Uh, on, on the screen and I've picked the, the kind of important bit. Uh, the rest of the data is a breakdown of pressure ulcers by age. Some organisations might find that useful, uh, but this is the, these are the, 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 the key bits here. So let's just look at it row by row. So pressure ulcer overview, the first, first row. Spells with a pressure ulcer diagnosis present as a proportion of all spells. What does even that mean? Uh, we'll break it down. Spells means patient episodes or times when your patient's on your caseload. Episodes care. So how many pressure ulcers um, have there been divided by the total number of episodes of care? So this first row is giving you like a pressure ulcer rate. So it's, it's the, the number of patient episodes where a pressure ulcer is developed, divided by your total number of patient episodes. So it's a rate or a percentage. The next line is the actual count. How many pressure ulcers, um, how many patient episodes have there been where a pressure ulcer is present? So an actual number. Then the next section is something that you might be interested in, uh, which is the split between how many your organisation acquired and how many are present on admission. So what a lot of us tissue viability nurses will say is that while we accept that we play an important role in the strategic um, management of pressure ulcers that acquire in our organisation, um, our responsibility uh, is not to influence others. Actually, that could be argued because we should all be helping each other, shouldn't we? But uh, first and foremost, our responsibility is about managing the pressure ulcers and preventing pressure ulcers that are happening within our organisation. So this is a useful split. Um, the reason why it's an all percent, and I'm only going to touch on this, otherwise it'll wreck your head if you've not looked at this system before. Um, once clinical code is start to use the Y95 code, as well as the pressure ulcer code, we'll start seeing these percentages look a little bit differently. So for example, if we had seven pressure ulcers in the month of December, and um, I'm going to keep it simple maths now. Uh, so if we had 10 pressure ulcers in the month of December, and six of them happened uh, during their episode of care here, then we would see a split there with 60% and 40%. If the Y95 code, which means something's happened here in the organisation, was used, 
And when we screenshotted this in December, those the, the Y95 code uh, isn't being used. In fact, it's not being used by many uh, clinical coders, I believe. And it's something that if we did want that split payer, payer organization, um, then the clinical coders um, could be could be using. So those top two, two rows, your rate of pressure ulcers for your organization and the actual count of pressure ulcers. That then feeds into the charts. So if we move along the rows, it's got peer median, national median, and then chart, and the charts are color of red and green. If you click anywhere on the, the, the red or green bar, it takes us to two different types of charts. So in your top right hand corner, you can see this information that's been fed in by your clinical coders into model hospital system. You can see your pressure data either in a trend line chart, which is this, or in a bar chart. I find the bar chart far easier, um, but the, and the colors that they use are the same. So the blue line is your organization's pressure or activity. The gray line is, the, is an average of your peers. So your peers might be the peers that the system has chosen to be your peers, or you can choose your own. And organizations might want to choose their own because they might want to choose organizations of a similar size or with a similar cohort of patients. And the black line is the, the national average. So you can see the national average and the peer average are very similar. But as an organization, you could vary uh, quite significantly. This is the variation chart. So we saw the, the trend line. This is the variation chart. So this is a bar chart in effect. And this is a bar chart comparing your organization with others and where your organization ranks in terms of pressure ulcer activity. So your organization will show in black. So you can see the, 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 black, uh, the black line on the chart there. So that's my organization. In gray is your peer group. So organizations who either the system or myself has chosen as being a good organization to benchmark against. The green organizations um, are the ones that are performing well. And the red ones are uh, the ones that are comparative to your organization or the ones that you've chosen not to be. So they're your non-peers. So what you can do is you can move your case along each of those bars uh, on the chart and you'll see the name of the organization and the pressure also rate. So you remember the rate is the number of episodes of care where pressure also is developed divided by the total number of episodes of care. Um, so you can move along there and what you can do, and I would suggest alongside your model hospital ambassador or your model health ambassador, is to um, look at organizations who are performing better than you according to the data. Um, and you can start to network with them, look at what initiatives they're doing to uh, to to maintain a lower instance pressure ulcers, um, and you can work collaboratively. Uh, and in essence, this will drive quality improvements. You can compare nationally with a larger number of organisations, or you can compare with a much smaller number of organisations. Um, so there's lots of different ways that you can uh, that you can look at the data and that there are more ways that you can look at the data but this is an introduction and it it would be overwhelming if we if we looked at every screen that model hospital can offer but in essence it's a benchmarking tool there will be there isn't yet but there will be lots of resources on the national wound care strategy um, programs uh, web page but not there yet because the system is still in very early days. Uh, Andy and I have been involved in the six month pilot in theory, kind of from April. Um, this was being kind of rolled out to some other organizations, but not everybody. So when you go on and look, you'll see how many organizations are participating and, and there's some who, have, who are just starting to participate for pressure ulcers and others who are still, um, still need to come on board. So, our suggestions for what you would do next, if this is completely brand new to you, this is what you should do next. If you're already familiar with it and you're up to speed, then you'll have some understanding of, of where you're at and where your organization's at. So what we suggest you do is first of all, register on it, uh, which is easy to do, log in, 
and have a look around it and just familiarize yourself with it. I would say do that with your model health ambassador because they are experts in using it. They've used it to look at other information and they will help you use it for pressure ulcers and quality, uh, quality improvements. If you don't know, if you're a TVN or a quality leader or a risk manager or a health professional who has an interest in national pressure ulcer reporting, who has any responsibility for it, any involvement in it, um, then if you don't already know who your clinical coding manager is, um, meet them uh, and talk to them. Um, and it might be that you want to do something similar to what we've done. We've got a, a, a document on EPR that the clinical coders will will go to for the accurate category of pressure ulcer. Because in a set of notes, you could have six different members of staff calling it a category two, a category three, and unstageable, moisture associated skin damage, a skin tear, friction injury. The coders have to code all of them and you will see once you're familiar with model health system when you look at your data you'll know instinctively whoa we we have not had that many pressure ulcers um, and you'll know then to actually look at the data um, and it might be that it's, it's going to take it's going to take many months if not years to get this actually to be a useful meaningful system for us all to be able to benchmark with one another um, so it's to kind of just relax. It's not going to um, it's not going to be a, an overnight thing that everyone's going to be judged upon and, and, and questions or challenged upon. However, I would say the next important point is to make sure that your director of nursing, your senior managers, your exec team, the board are aware of the changes. They will have heard the press resources are going to be starting to show our model health system. They will have a look on model health system because, again, they're kind of used to using it for other things. They will look and if your data isn't accurate at the minute or in the near future then you need to be giving them some narrative and some explanation it's in the early stages we're working with coders um you know we appreciate it's not some of them some of the issues might be about the the codings um not right it might be about the documentation not making it easy for the coding to be right or it might be that it's the system that actually still isn't able to um to give comparable information across organizations. So look out for all the resources, talk to other people. So talk to your colleagues who are all in the same boat, it's new to everyone. Uh, some people might have a bit more experience than others, lean on them and use them to be able to support you moving forward. But there will be lots more information, lots more talk about it, lots more resources. Um, reach out to your clinical coders and your model health uh, ambassadors for sure.